Hi everyone, I'm Rachel Harkness and I'm the Programming Manager at the Portland Public Library and I'm really happy to be hosting Meredith Hall and Simon Van Bowie today at our Literary Lunch Lecture Series. They will be discussing Meredith's newly released book, Ben Efficients. Uh, Meredith Hall is here. Uh, she's the author of the novel Beneficence. Her novel, her memoir Without a Map was instantly recognized as a classic of the genre and became a New York Times bestseller. It was named Best Book of the Year by Kirkus and Book Sense, as well as Elle's Reader's Pick of the Year. Meredith was a recipient of the 2004 Gift of Freedom Award from a room of her own foundation. Her work has appeared in Five Points, the Gettysburg Review, the Kenyon Review, the Southern Review, the New York Times, and many other publications. Meredith divides her time between Maine and California. Simon Van Bowie is the award-winning and best-selling author of 14 books, including Love Begins in Winter, winner of the Frank O'Connor International Sto Short Story Award, and Everything Beautiful Began After, which Andre de Boost III called a powerful meditation on the undying nature of love and the often cruel beauty of one's own fate. He has written for the New York Times, The Guardian, National Public Radio, The Financial Times, and the BBC. His next novel, Night Came With Many Stars, is due to be published in 2020. So I'll turn it over to you guys, and thanks for being here. Thank you, Rachel. Thanks, Rachel. It's so nice to, be, to see you all and to be with one of my favorite writers, Meredith. So for those of you who are new to Meredith's work, um, I'll start by saying that um, her first book really broke a lot of ground uh, in terms of theme, in terms of uh, story and language. Uh, and, you know, it freed a lot of people from prisons. They'd been in prisons, you know, that were erected by secrets and by shame. And so Meredith's book wasn't just a great book of literature. It was an important book for the country. Um, now, this new book uh, is... Meredith's first novel. So this is very exciting. Uh, and I'm gonna ask her some questions. Meredith hasn't seen the questions, so um, <laughs> um, this is impromptu. Uh, but the first question I wanted to, to ask Meredith um, was, was it weird writing fiction as opposed to memoir? Um, I think that it was actually a great, relief to move from memoir to fiction. By the time I was ready to start Beneficence, I had been traveling the country without a map, doing readings and workshops and uh, giving speeches. And with memoir, the conversation isn't always about the book, it's also about the life. And I found after a couple of years of talking to people about my life, that I really wanted to find some cover and I uh, decided that I would try fiction. And I have, uh, you know, I taught in the graduate program at the University of New Hampshire for many years and um, always teach narrative writing. And I thought, well, narrative writing is narrative writing. How hard can this be? But as I moved into fiction, I started understanding the very specific challenges that come with fiction. So it took me a long time. I kind of muddled around uh, both looking for my story and also um, trying to get my legs under me. You know, I'm a, I, I read a great deal. I feel familiar with fiction. I certainly feel familiar with narrative writing. But that move into story that doesn't exist unless I make it was really a big move for me. Once I, I feel as if there was some sort of boundary that I needed to cross. And when I, once I crossed that boundary, I just sort of slipped over it one day. And once I found myself on the other side, I was ready to run. I really, really loved it. I find that writing fiction, um, this, this idea that I can make anything, I can make everything is so delicious to me that it's a very joyful process. Mm. And when, when my daughter was very young, she said, um, you know, I said, you know, I need you to tell me about what happened with the ice cream at school, you know. And she said, well, I know it's wrong to lie. She said, but you get paid for it. <laughs> That's your job. <laughs> uh, well, I said, yeah, I suppose it is. But the difference is, is that when I tell lies, I believe they're true. Yes, you know, when, 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 at moments I feel like, understand what you're saying, you know, writing fiction, you can make it up, but it has to feel as true as something that wasn't made up. 
And, and that that's tough for me. It, you know, it's also problematic because I find that the characters that I wrote and the life that they're living, um, these are so real to me that once I found this story, it took me, as I remember, maybe... Um, maybe eight or 10 or 12 months to write this book once I actually knew what I was doing. And for that time, I lived more fully, I think, in the lives of this center family and on this farm in Alstead, Maine, than I was living my own life. It was a very strange thing. I felt so profoundly integrated uh, inside this family and their home and their farm that the, the, the line between lying and truth became very thin for me. Yeah, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the writer, the Irish writer, John McGahan, he said um, that uh, fiction is, is very strange because, um, you know, you, it's so dramatic because it's, it's life distilled into, into a story. He said, so in order for that to to happen, his life has to be very boring. <laughs> uh, so he's not writing, he's walking around the fields looking at cows, yes. or deciding what milk he should buy. And he said, you know, the drama has to be in the work rather than, than in life. And I've always, you know, when you're young, you think, you know, I want to be a writer, but then you realize that you're gonna have to, you either be a writer or you be the person who gets written about. And mm -hmm. it seems to me that, uh, you know, for us, the only choice was to, like the like um, the Lady of Shalott. You know, I think in the Tennyson poem, to sort of hang back in our towers and watch life unfold. Yeah, that's very interesting. Yes, it's it is certainly an interior life. I have said all my life, long before I understood that I was a writer. You know, I didn't. I was fifty-seven years old when I wrote my first book, and long before I understand that I'm a writer. Um, you know, when I when I did start writing, uh, as Without a Map uh, came together, my memoir, I suddenly felt as if I was literally climbing, sort of like Peter Pan, climbing into this skin that belonged to me um, for the first time. But there, I have said all my life, I live in my brain. And now as a writer, I understand what that means in a very different way. All that time you weren't writing, were you writing in your head or were you making notes or writing stories or? Well, I wasn't aware that I was writing in my head, but I have found, I've discovered about myself that I am a storyteller. I, I love telling story. And um, I tell story anytime I have a chance, whether I'm writing or not. I have a friend who teases me that she can't ask me any question, any simple question without me breaking out into some kind of story to, to answer her question. So I've always been making story. And um, I also have several cartons of scraps of paper and they are really scraps. They are often the backs of napkins written while I'm driving the car or in a quiet moment when I'm in the classroom or, uh, you know, I'm busy in the house and I'll go and find a scrap of paper. And there are ideas, things that have come to me, language that I've heard, things that I've seen. And I literally have thousands of these pieces of paper. And I realize now that those are stories waiting to be written. And uh, periodically I'll get into one of these boxes and pull a fistful out. And some of them mean nothing to me now. I have no idea why I even wrote them down, but several of them really start triggering ideas for me. So I think that um, I was not actually writing. I kept a journal when I was a very young girl. And um, as I tell in my memoir, got pregnant in a small town in New Hampshire when I was 16 in 1965 and was expelled from school for it. And um, and expelled from my family for it. And during that period, I uh, destroyed those journals. I didn't want anybody, I, I felt so vulnerable that I didn't want anybody finding those journals. And I think because of that sense of vulnerability, I never picked up the habit again. So I don't keep journals and uh, the writing all happens in my head and it happens there constantly. Yeah, that's interesting. That's a very moving story. And it, it makes me think of the power of writing that it's so, it's so, uh epic 
that one has to burn the books, yeah. burn the journals, yeah. because it, when, when it's in the world, it's entrenched somehow. Yeah. Uh, just these little symbols on a page, you know, the power of that. Correct me if I'm wrong, Meredith, but the day you were expelled from school was, the, was also the day that you were asked to leave your home. Yes, same day. Yes, that's right. Yeah. You know, I think that there's something that you just said that catches my attention. There has been a surprise for me as both of these books have moved into the world that once they are in the world, until the moment that they're actually um, available for people to other people to read, it's mine. It belongs to me and it's part of my brain and my heart. And um, it's a very interesting act uh, to negotiate um, that the intimacy, the profound intimacy of what I have put on the page with the public. Of course, I long for it, I'm excited about it. I can't wait for the book to move out into the, into the world and have people discover it and read it, hopefully like it. Um, but it's, I find that that's a very significant moment for me when, it is, when a book is no longer mine. The, those symbols on the page actually can be translated by people. They're understood by people and it goes out to, all, to anybody. Yeah, that's, that's very interesting because the thing is it doesn't really come to life until somebody reads it in a sense. Um, I mean, what I mean by that is if I say, oh, there's a nice tree outside, then everybody who's attending this event is thinking about a tree and the idea of what outside means. Um, but it's a different tree and a different outside. And yet we're talking about the same thing. And yet what we're talking about is completely unknowable to one another. So there's a sort of, there's a sort of alchemy in writing that I have, can't really get my head around. Yes. Yes, I absolutely agree. It is very interesting what that collaboration is. It's as if um, it's as if there has to be a receiver. Somebody has to receive this and collaborate with me as they read this and um, and return their own thinking about it. Sort of. Uh, add their thinking about what's on the page. And I find it thrilling. It's, it, I love communicating with readers. It, it, it is just a joyful thing to have readers tell me how they understood my book and um, what they're thinking about it. I think that there is a collaboration. And I think as a writer, I don't think that we are aware of readers as far as um, thinking about what readers might want, what readers might think, I'm completely unaware of that. But when I write on the page, I am very aware that there will be readers. I want those readers of what's on the page. So. Are you aware of them while you're writing? Are you, do you picture a, a writer once told me that she pictured this gallery of people, like, you know, almost like a jury <laughs> sitting there you know, beyond her typewriter as she's writing. Do you have certain people that you write to? No, I don't at all. And uh, actually, um, both with my memoir and my novel, these are just, a, it's a profoundly separate place. It's a very, actually a very isolating place by choice. Um, and I am not aware of uh, a sort of public out there while I do it. When I wrote my memoir, uh, I was breaking secrets. I was really breaking an expectation by telling secrets so late in my life that I had, had been sworn to by my family. And I found that the act was so large, it was so significant that, uh, and scary, it was scary, that I found that I actually constructed a kind of old woman, a crone, who I was in San Francisco while I wrote this book, and she sat in this wonderful crummy little rooftop apartment I had that looked out over my neighborhood, and um, cold, a cold apartment. And this old lady sat next to me. She never said a word in all the months that I worked on that book, but she leaned in. She literally leaned toward me, listening and conveying uh, just great love and acceptance and non-judgment. Non so uh, she, I had a listener with my memoir. Um, I don't think, I never confused her with a reader. It wasn't the public, but I had somebody listening to me during that time. I didn't have that experience at all with the novel, with Beneficence. 
Um, it was what was delicious for me about it was that I was so solo. I really entered this world alone and carved it out. And uh, it was it was just it was a very, very joyful and wonderful process. Often for me with a book, there's a moment when it sort of catches or, or when something lodges. Um, you know, like if you put on an old jacket and you find something in the pocket, what was the moment for you where, I mean, because of all the, th a writer of your abilities could write about anything, any period in history, you know, anything really. So what was it that, that um, caught your imagination, you know, and, and um, encouraged you sort of propelled you to set this where you did with the people who were in it? Uh, you know, it's it's odd because the family seemed to come to me already, uh, already intact, already a family, and in fact, already named. I didn't even need to make up their names. They already came named. When I first imagined this story, it came from a very small snippet of conversation with a neighbor. And um, something he said sparked this story. I suddenly understood. I had been, I had been looking for a long, long time for a story that I wanted to write. And here it suddenly was. Uh, and instantly I saw it as a farm um, after the war in a small town in Maine. And I, I don't think I made a decision about that. It's, that's, that was immediately what I saw and where I understood it would be placed. And as soon as I started writing that, it felt very intuitive. It felt as if I knew this place and wanted to be there. That was it. I wanted to be there. And uh, I, I was unhappy each day when it was time to finally get away from my computer and not be there anymore. I loved being there. Was the setting anywhere that you recognized from your own life? Hmm. Uh, from my imagined life, I think. I'm not sure my real life. You know, I've lived in Maine all all my life. My, my um, grandparents and great-grandparents migrated through Maine uh, many, many generations ago, going back generations. So Maine is, is mine. It's my home. And I think people living in a small town in Maine, as I have, know farmers. They know dairy farmers. They know the farming life. There's always a feed store in town. It's a, a life that's familiar um, I raised sheep and chickens while I was, while my children were small and growing up. So I think that really what I created was a place that, um, that I feel a longing for, a kind of nostalgia for, a life and a time that I feel a nostalgia for, although it predates me and, um, and I never knew that life. It's, it's very appealing to me. There's something, um, this grace that I find for the centers on this farm, that grace is something that is very, very attractive to me. And the, the way in which beneficence um, pervades the life that they've built, uh, is, it's a very, very appealing world to me. Was there anything from your first book that transferred over into this book, anything that maybe had remained unsaid from your first book, or is this a completely new um, journey? I'm not sure if anything actually carried forward into this book. Um, not that I was aware of it all as I was writing it. Um, but I think that there is actually how I see myself, how I see the world, how I understand people, how I understand our purpose, how I understand love and our obligations to love and um, how I understand the ways in which we reckon with the harm that love does and um, how we rebuild from there and reconstruct lives around that harm. I think that these are, you know, it, it feels as if with both my memoir and actually much more with this novel, I feel as if I've sort of unzippered my, my head and my heart and said, okay, this is me. This is my world. Uh, I'm walk right in because I'm offering it to you. This is unguarded Meredith Hall and how, how I see the world. And I do see that similarity with both the memoir and this fiction. Um, I think that it's a, I'm an earnest person and there is not a lot withheld of myself in this writing, so. 
one of the things I love about this book is that it um, it allows me to connect emotionally to the characters and to the text and to, to, to what's happening in the story. Um, I find that a lot of modern fiction, you know, post-war fiction is a little bit, um, a little bit um, self-righteous in a strange way and clever and mm. cynical mm. and smarmy. <laughs> and, um, it's sort of like one's entrance into an intellectual club that really isn't worth being in because it's a dead end. Um, and this book in the Irish tradition and in the Nigerian tradition and in the, um, you, what used to be maybe the French tradition um, is something that's just unabashedly uh, authentic and emotional and, and um, sentences are not paired back for fear of people feeling too much. They're paired back that, so that people can feel and people can, Almost what I'm trying to say is, is that a lot of books play into the escapist fantasy of the modern world, but I feel like this book gives you a deeper experience of yourself. So, you know, it, it really pushes you into your, into your own emotional landscape in a way that maybe it hasn't been seen before. Well, I appreciate your saying that, Simon. Um, I hope that I'm up to that praise. I agree with you about a lot of modern fiction, and it's not interesting to me. Um, I have sometimes question whether I'm missing something, I'm just not getting something that is larger and it's beyond me. Uh, but my experience is that there's a great deal of masking and a great deal of uh, self-protecting. I think that people uh, come at our lives and how we express our lives with a lot of fear. I think there's a great deal of anxiety and fear. And I see that in this kind of uh, masking of self-confidence and, um, and righteousness in modern fiction. And I just, I really am not built that way. It's uh, um, if we're going to have a conversation, we're here a very short time and we're given a grace of an extraordinary opportunity to live a life for these years. And um, I love that life and I feel enormous awe and gratitude that we get to do this. And I wanna talk about it and I want to share that. Yeah, well, I certainly appreciate that. Um, and you know, it's true. I mean, if you're reading a book, you want to connect with it in a way that it's memorable. I mean, how many books does one read you, that one forgets within mm -hmm. six months to a year? Mm -hmm. You know, um, but this book, this is something that, you know, if I was evacuating Brooklyn, I would pack this in a, in a, in, a, in my, in my suitcase. With a few other books. You're so kind. But no, I'm serious because the thing is, you know, 50 years from now, 100 years from now, when things that are considered valuable here in New York are, are, are considered worthless, you know, they're too valuable to even use. Uh, you know, um, what am I going to give to my children or grandchildren that will help them live. I mean, science tells us, it gives us all, kind of, all kinds of useful information. But it can't tell us how to deal with being rejected by one's family. Mm -hmm. It can't tell us how to deal with disappointment or the loss of somebody, sudden loss of somebody or something like that. Mm -hmm. Stories do, mm -hmm. um, you know. And so this is almost like a kind of medicine, just like your first book was, you know, both books I think are about families being pulled apart by some inner turmoil. And so I feel like it's a, it is something that people are always going to experience in every culture. And so your book is sort of a, almost like a roadmap through. <laughs> you know, I, I think that a writer has an obligation to work toward what I call a blueprint. I think that readers are looking for a blueprint and uh, a writer is being turned to, we turn to books, hoping to find another clue in that, in that blueprint. And um, I also think, you know, I, I mentioned that I love storytelling and storytelling is how I put my world together. It's how I understand the world. And um, I think that in both of these books, I am responding to um, a kind of 
an absence of vacuum in my own childhood and young life, nobody ever told stories around me. I don't remember, literally don't remember a single family story. I don't remember anybody saying, you know, once your granddad did this when he took the boat out. I don't remember a single family story. And I, I, I am guessing that my hunger for story comes from that feeling that I didn't learn anything. Nobody passed anything on to me. Nobody taught me through those stories. You know, if, if there is an uncle in the family who has an, a, a problem with alcohol, I never learned about it. I never heard anything about how the family and he managed through that. Or uh, if somebody had lost somebody, you know, it's, um, we, we, I just didn't hear those stories. And they are vital, I think. For me, those stories are vital. And um, I'm sure that I'm telling all the stories I never heard uh, as when I was young. Uh, those stories are all pouring onto the page now. I want to know how did people live that, that life? How do each of us, um, uh, we all know loss. We all know the feeling of being outside the world, not really belonging. We all know questions about how fully loved we are and how safe we are in that love. And we all, we know questions about how, um, how full and adequate we are as parents. These are, uh, these are questions that we all look at every day of our lives. And I, I um, am very, very interested in them. And the only way I know to look at those questions is through stories and watching, watching characters that I create on the page um, ask themselves those questions and make their way through them. Wow, well said, beautifully said, Meredith. Um, I've got the book here um, and ready for my evacuation. And um, I, I, it's, it's really, uh, just so elegantly made and it's really a work of art. I mean, when I see, when I go into a bookshop and I see, you know, cheap paperbacks, you know, printed on, on very thin paper, it, you know, people read them and throw them away. I mean, what's the point, you know? Um, but with something like this, it's something you can savor and treasure and it's gonna last, you know? If, so it's nice to see a book as, as, as a work of art and, you know, not just what's inside, but the actual presentation of it, instead of just like, you know, a, a moment, something, a tool to help you escape. Um, so I'm gonna ask you, would you be so kind as to read uh, a little yes, from it? I would. Um, you know, I want to say, I agree. I think it's a beautiful book and it feels good to hold it and to read it. And that's David R. Godin Publishing. They make beautiful books and they made a beautiful book of beneficence, so. Okay, I am going to read in Doris's voice. This beneficence is told in three voices. Um, there is a family of five. Doris is the wife and uh, mother. And Top is the father and husband. They have three children, Sonny, Dodie, and Beston. Doris, the mother has a voice, Top, the father has a voice, and Dodie, that middle child, the only girl, has a voice. They, they speak their stories in rounds. We move Doris, Dodie, the daughter, Top, again and again as we move in time from 1947 through until the mid-1960s. We're on a farm in Maine in a, a fictional town called Alstead, Maine. This is a, a successful farm. Top and Doris have made a very successful dairy farm. Small, but very successful and very beautiful. It's a very beautiful place. This is, um, this is shortly into uh, the beginning of the book. Doris is talking. She's the one who's introducing us to this life. And um, I thought I would just choose a, a short anecdote to share with you. The school play was coming up and Dodie and Beston had parts. Sonny was growing up and wouldn't participate, which I was sorry about, his unwillingness to pretend for one hour that he was someone or something other than 13-year-old Sonny Center. But Best and Dodie were still just children and believed in that kind of play. And so that Saturday was a day of excitement around the house. Dodie let the chickens out of the coop and fed them without any reminders and swept the dooryard and shed, running from task to task. 
Beston filled the crock in the outhouse with lime, lugging the heavy bag between his legs and ran to me to ask what he was supposed to do next. They were both going to be poor villagers in a play the students wrote called Tomorrow. And I told them we would choose their costumes and wash their hair after noon dinner. We dug around in the closet in the upstairs hall. It's a place that gathers boxes of outgrown clothes and wool coats that are too frayed to be worn. Top says I shouldn't collect things we don't use. I tell him that we can't be certain that we will always have the shoes and clothes we need and at least we will be warm no matter what comes. He snorts and tells me that his wife and children will never need to wear rags. But today those rags were handy. The children were very pleased with themselves. They ran out together to show Sonny their get-ups and then refused to take them off until I called them in for hair washing. I cleared the counter by the kitchen sink and laid down a big towel. Who goes first, I asked, and Dodie said she would. They pulled off their jerseys and my daughter climbed from a chair and lay down, her soft dark hair trailing in the sink and her skinny legs stretched out along the counter. I told her to close her eyes and ran the water until it was warm. As I lathered her hair, I watched her beautiful little face, somehow so like mine and tops all at the same time, her hands clasped on her chest, so familiar. How can I love such a simple chore, one among hundreds in a week? I rinsed the soap down the drain and wrapped her head in a towel, and she let me hold to her while I rubbed the water out of her hair. I combed it out and lifted her down and we were done. And then I lifted Best up and he laid his little boy's body out on the counter so earnestly, another job to be done in his day. And I offered him a washcloth for his eyes because he is frightened of the soap, but he said no because I knew Dodie had not used one. And he closed his eyes tightly and let me scoop the warm water over his short, dark hair. Here was a face I knew less fully, my youngest and most mysterious child. Beston asks so little of me, of Top and his brother and sister. He watches and smiles and knows how to be by himself. While Dodie chatters to me and Sonny makes his way to his father's side to work, Best is always on the edge of things, it seems. I often have the urge to gather him up and tell him that he is as important as the noisier older children, that Top and I love him and admire him just as much. But he doesn't seem to need to hear that, and the days go on with all of that just a thought. This child's face is open, guileless, and I was flooded with a feeling that I had unwittingly withheld something from him that a mother owes her children. You're a very good boy, Best, I said. Yes, he said his eyes still closed, his arms relaxed at his sides, trusting me. I don't remember the play now, only those minutes in the old closet and Dodie and Best prancing around in their costumes and their little bodies stretched out on the counter for their hair washing. I remember pulling Best to me as I had Dodie, his willing lean into me as I rubbed his hair dry. That's fantastic. And um, it does that rare thing. Your book does that rare thing, I feel. You know, when, when you're reading and you forget you're reading and you're just so in the story that you don't realize that anything's going on. It's sort of this strange journey in silence. Mm -hmm. um, so what, what the characters are, are going through, you actually feel as a reader, as though you're part of, of the family. Um, so I really admire that, you know, your writing is sort of like a scaffolding um, for the feeling beneath. It serves the story. It doesn't serve anything else. Um, I came across a quote recently by Flaubert, who said that um, I think the writer should be everywhere, should be present, but at, everywhere, but nowhere visible. Like, like God that. in nature. Yes. Uh, and I, that's how I feel about your work. Now, to go into the mechanics, um, I will say that, like, I really marveled at some of the techniques, and I was just red with jealousy at some of the things that you did. I, I didn't even... What an honor, Simon. Thank you. Um, if, it, if I was a Funko Pop, you know, those little plastic figures at Barnes & Noble, I would be a red one. Um, <laughs> but because you do things with language that I didn't really know were possible 
um, and that I can't even begin to experiment with because it doesn't work when I try it. And one of those things is how you switch tenses. Um, I see you laughing, so you know. Um, would you talk a little about the mechanics? Like, do you, how do you edit? Do you just do a rough draft or do you meticulously work like, you know, a forensics person just putting things down very carefully? How do you do it? Well, after teaching writing for many, many years and teaching drafting and revision and revision and revision, I don't actually write that way. I am not, I never, when a section is done, it's done. I don't return to it and rewrite it or move things around in the book. So I think that what I am doing is a very, I think I'm writing slowly and carefully at the time that it moves onto the page. Um, I will say that I'm not making any decisions. I believe that writing is a craft and we are working at our craft, but it seems to be a very subconscious act. I'm not aware of making decisions. I'm paying very, very close attention. That seems to be what I'm doing. I'm, I'm paying very close attention, but I'm not making decisions about um, you know, voice or what's going to, even what's going to happen next. Um, so I'm not really uh, describing this very well. I'm afraid I don't have a good understanding of what it is that I'm doing as I do it. I laughed when you mentioned the verb tenses because I was afraid that my wonderful editor, Josh Bodwell at Godin would say, uh-uh, uh-uh, there's no way this is going to fly. And he didn't do that. He, um, he was hands off and allowed those that use of, of tense to stay on the page. And I think for me, there's a logic to it. it. And that logic entirely comes to the act of storytelling. For me, each of these people is in the moment on the page. I am telling you a story. This happened once, this happened once, and it might be yesterday or this morning or five years ago or when I was 23, but there is always a present of the storyteller and then everything else is past. I write episodically. There are a lot of um, double spaces on the page. I, I move from episode to episode to episode as, my, as I and my characters tell stories. And um, those episodes bring us back to that present moment, that storyteller's moment, as if, as if Doris or Top or Dodie is sitting in a kitchen chair talking to us and we are in this moment. But when we tell stories, all our stories are in the past. They're not in the present, they're all in the past. And that's where these people go. And it's beyond yeah, that, I, I don't have a good description of my writing process. I listen to Gregorian chants every time I write. And uh, I have, from the time I first tried to be a writer when I wrote my memoir, um, I needed to find music that uh, had no words, or at least words that I could understand. I don't speak Latin, and um, and I, they, it needed to be beautiful music. It needed to be music that was there but didn't require any attention. And um, I somehow stumbled on Gregorian chants, and one of my sons put together a very very long loop that I can listen to for an entire day of of uh, writing. Interestingly, I've done this so often, I know, I, I know what's coming next. I've listened to this loop so long. Um, and I don't listen to these chants any other time. If I get up to uh, go make a cup of tea, it goes off. I don't want to be in another room hearing this as background. This is my, my place to write. And because I've been doing this so long, there's a very strange thing that happens that I come in, I get set up, I turn on my computer, and I turn on, I flip that switch and turn on the Gregorian chants. And somehow it's a switch right here. It just has become a part of how I make my writing and click, I'm in and down I go. And uh, it's an instantaneous response. So I somehow have conditioned myself to move immediately into that area as soon as I hear this very beautiful and haunting music. It is very haunting. Uh, I don't know what any of it means, but it's very haunting. Um, so there are certain things that I know about myself as I write, and there are certain things I can't describe to you. It's a, it's a, a profoundly interior place that I am moving from. And um, when it's done, it's done. I, that's all I can tell you. So. Every day when I sit down to write, 
I go for, for a few minutes listing off some excuses where you know maybe you should change the tires on your car today maybe you should maybe you need to research about that rare disease from Sri Lanka that you might have you know I always think of excuses where maybe I don't actually have to ride today I can take the day off um do you because you know the, for me there's a lot of fear or just I know what torture lies ahead when I sit down to write when you sit down to write do you ever have that feeling or does it just but you um, I don't have that feeling. And I think maybe it's because I waited so long in my life to write. It is without question the most joyful and most fun and most satisfying and most profound, um, most perplexing thing that I do. You know, I think I read once um, a review of a main artist's work and the woman, uh, the, the writer had been invited to this artist's studio. And she reports that she understood immediately the misstep she made. She walked into his studio and his paintings were all over the studio, on the floor and on tables and easels. And she gushed and she said, oh my God, it must feel so wonderful to come out here every day and create beauty. And he snapped at her. He was very annoyed with it. And he said, I don't make beauty. What I do is solve problems. And I believe that. I think that that's what we're doing when we sit down to write. And I happen to really like solving problems. <laughs> it's a really, really fun and joyful thing for me. So um, I get tied up. I get, I get boxed in. I find dead ends. Um, I have a lot of questions about what it is that a character still hasn't said to us. What is it that this character wants us to know? And what story is going to be his or her vehicle to uh, opening that part of him or herself to us? And I love that work. So I, you know, I've only written two books, Simon. You've written a lot of books and maybe this will change over time for me, but I definitely am feeling that um, what I discovered uh, when I was 57 is that I really, really love doing this. It's a very joyful thing. Uh, I do cry a lot when I write these books. I find that I am empathizing with the characters, even in my memoir, when that character was me, that girl, that younger girl, uh, really broke my heart. And um, I've, I've cried a lot of tears of compassion for and love for these characters, both fictive and, and real. That's nice to hear. It, it's strange what you said about you, you know, you're living with the family and then you finish writing for the day and then you go into your own life after yes. having spent the day somewhere else. Yes, yes, yes. And the, I don't want to leave. <laughs> when I finished this book, I felt real heartbreak. I didn't want to be done with it. I, I was not ready. I've had a lot of readers be in touch with me saying that they've slowed way down in the last 20 or 30 pages because they don't want the book to end. And I felt that as a writer. Um, I, I really dawdled around at the end of this book. I didn't want to close it and be done with it. Um, yeah, I mean, with COVID as well, it, it, it helps people, it helped me actually slow down in my own emotional life and look at what's around me instead of what's ahead, mm. you know. Mm. Mm. So it, it's, it's really a boon, it's really a gift. Um, well, you know, the other thing too, is that I think that this book, um, you know, a terrible thing happens to this family. They're a family that loves each other very, very deeply and well. They do a good job at their love for each other. They are loyal to each other. They like each other. They love being in each other's company. Doris and Tup have a very intimate and private relationship. Um, and this book, something awful happens to this family and they have to make their way through that. And um, I think that the kind of loss that they experience is uh, it's familiar to everybody. Every human being knows loss. Every human being um, knows uh, this, knows sorrow and questions about why these things happen to us in our lives. And I think right now with COVID, um, the, the, we're, we all are feeling a very perplexed sense of sorrow and loss. And so I think that, um, that it's timely in that way. Yes, I see, I see Rachel is here. 
Yeah, hi. <laughs> Thank you so much. I think we just have a little bit of time for questions. So um, I think we'll wrap up that conversation. It was really lovely. And, and Meredith, I have to apologize. I even practiced pronouncing the name of your book that I've been saying the wrong way in my head for years and got it wrong in my <laughs> Zoom anxiety. So I'm sorry about that. Um, That's fun. <laughs> Uh, so we have some great questions on the Zoom chat. Uh, I will start with a question from Mira Patassin. Uh, she says, hello, I'm a nonfiction author. And when I hear fiction writers talk about their characters, a common line I hear is something about really getting to know their characters. I want to understand what it feels like because I have only written about real people. Can you tell me not only the process of how to create a three-dimensional character and how to do it well, and what it feels like to create a fictional person. Well, it feels great. It feels like you're adding to your family. You're getting to make up these people and it feels pretty wonderful. Um, I think that, I think there is no real trick to creating. Uh, there is no, there aren't, um, there aren't rules. There aren't, there aren't steps to take in creating a, a full character. I think there is a willingness from the beginning. The writer, the writer needs to love this person. And if, if we love this person, then we are going to listen and pay very, very close attention to who that person is. I think that that's the, for me, that's the key is a willingness to, um, to give it all and dare to love these people. Okay, here's another question from uh, Steve. Who are a few of Meredith's favorite writers? For example, what books are those behind you? Oh. <laughs> well, I have books all over my house and uh, in piles, in fact, vertical piles now I've run out of shelves. My favorite writers, I admire Marilyn Robinson very much. I admire Kent Hariff. I think that Plain Song and Eventide are very, very beautiful books. Maybe my favorite writer is Faulkner. I admire the, the density of the world that he creates for us. And uh, I also love the trust he has in the reader to figure it out. He doesn't make it easy for us. And I love how much he trusts us as readers. I have just discovered a Newfoundland writer this week. His name is Michael Crummy. And... Um, he, he writes from Newfoundland. He's not a very, he's, he's known some in Canada, but wow, is he a storyteller. If you want to read some really stunning storytelling taking place in a, in a, in a location, a geography that this writer knows inside out, I'm very excited right now at this minute um, about Michael Crummy. And I will say that Simon Van Bowie's Everything Beautiful happens after it's just incredibly beautiful this is a writer Simon's questions today have been very interesting and purposeful to me because Simon is a writer who loves his people and um, he he dares to enter the lives of these people very very fully and they are achingly beautiful stories thank you and uh, here's a question from Susan the dialogue feels to me somewhat formal. For example, little use of contractions dictated by time setting, that's a question. Or how did you make this choice? Mm, not dictated, dictated by time setting because I think probably if I looked, it carries right through to the end of the book. It's a voice that was very comfortable for me. I don't think, I didn't make a decision to use the voice. When I was done, I needed to look at whether I would keep that voice, but it was a voice that was very intuitive for me at the time that I was writing. It was how I hear um, not only their dialogue with each other, but how they talk to us, how they tell their stories to us. And I think there is, there's a kind of, a, there is a kind of, a kind of tradition of formality to it uh, that also is actually quite country. Main country people have a very, um, a very kind of old fashioned formality to their speech, very British Isles formality that's very beautiful. I'm just searching through, that looks like all of the questions that have been submitted via Zoom, but I did wanna point out that our lovely uh, literary librarian, uh, Becca has posted some Michael Crummy books that you can borrow from the library. <laughs> <laughs> we also have Simon's books as well. Um, 
And if we don't have a copy of yours, Meredith, your newest one, we, we will have it soon. We have a, a budget freeze at the moment, which has been making getting books difficult. Um, it's just a difficult I can, time. For I can confirm, uh, Meredith, I just ordered a bunch of your books. They're very in demand right now, so. <laughs> Great. Great, wonderful. Thank you very much. I also have one more question, Rachel, I'll send to you now, just came in. Okay, great. Uh, this one is unattributed, but Meredith, I'm always grateful for your insight. Your writing has a depth of wisdom. Do you have any insight on how to weave that into the story? I originally had wisdom and learning in an afterwards in my memoir. You seamlessly weave thoughts through scenes. Any insight on how a writer might improve on that? Hmm. So I, th I think that this, uh, this writer is right. I think that I am a writer who is in constant conversation with the reader. And I like that. I'm, I am, my characters are talking, but I'm also talking through these characters uh, all the time. I love the feeling that I am, um, that, I, that I can speak out loud and that those thoughts uh, carry that they that they have weight and they carry and um, it's for me I think it comes down to trusting um, that the reader won't be annoyed if I actually talk if the writer is um, it's a kind of uh, ventriloquism I think the writer is a ventriloquist through these characters of uh, thoughts and ideas and questions uh, that the writer has and the the characters uh, kind of bravely and willingly carry uh, those those ideas uh, through to the reader. So um, this is a that's a, a a correct observation. I am talking to the reader constantly on the page. Uh, in my memoir, I did it. It was me. And in this fiction, there is a kind of ventriloquism, and it's my characters that are carrying um, my my personal. Um, observations on the page. Great. Well, I wanted to thank Meredith and Simon again. Thank you so much for being a part of this, um, this series. And um, I wanted to thank everyone for coming. We had such a great audience. I think there were about 54 at, at one point, um, So, which is great for a Wednesday afternoon. I do want to let everyone know that we are archiving all of these conversations. Um, the one plus side of having to do them all virtually is that they are beautifully recorded. So they're all on our website, on our events pages, um, and they're links to YouTube videos. And uh, we are in the process of, of making podcasts out of all of these, these conversations because they really truly are just too good to just listen to once. So I invite you all to take a look at our website and, um, and we'll see you all again very soon. Thank Wonderful. you. Thank you. Simon, thank you. That was really a joy. Thank you so much. Thanks, Meredith. Thanks for this fantastic book. Thank and you. And for just being you. Thank you. A great conversation. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you for uh, clicking in and just being part of this today. <laughs>